Hey everyone, Brian Rhodes here. Uh, well, I'm going to uh, give you my writer's comments on scenes 35 to 65 today. Um, uh, I just want to emphasize though the purpose for all of this. It's obviously to give you some insight into this screenplay, better, better left unsaid, but more importantly is to just keep emphasizing that a screenplay has a certain shape to it. I happen to follow Blake Snyder's uh, format. Uh, it works very well for me. Uh, and is helping me tremendously. Uh, there are others out there, uh, probably um, uh, more than you can imagine, uh, but with each writer that uh, makes suggestions in, these, in this regard, there will always be some shape to the screenplay that you'll have to follow. Uh, that's just the way it is accepted. Um, and uh, certainly accept it if you expect to get a screenplay published because that's what Blake Snyder's all about. He says follow this format and you will have a screenplay that should, if the story is good, be of interest to a producer, okay? That's why I follow him. Uh, now, we're gonna pick it up. Uh, scene 35, halfway through uh, Fun and Games. Fun and Games is a little bit misnamed, I think. Uh, it's not fun and games, ha-ha fun and games. It's fun and games like the little things that happen, you know? Little things that happen that advance the plot. Uh, interesting things, not necessarily funny, but some, fun can, uh, some funny parts can be in in injected without question. But in this case, we're going to start with Charlie renting the apartment upstairs in the bar from, G from uh, Jake, okay? I stole this from the fa Phantom of the Opera. Um, look, the idea was to get Charlie inside the bar. He knows that Boston rehearses every night or most nights after hours. So what better way to hopefully meet his son accidentally maybe uh, and give him a leg up. Note though that Charlie's strategy is to help his son as a stranger, not to tell him the truth. He feels that if Boston finds out that he's his dad, that he will never speak to him again. He won't ever have a chance of, of redemption. So he chooses not to tell the truth, not to address his son with the truth. He's going to do it behind his back by helping him give him a leg up as a stranger. That's why this move takes place. Very important move down the line, as you're going to see. Um, and then, of course, we have Boston, that moment where he's laying down upstairs, it's after hours, he hears music from downstairs. This is his chance. This is the chance he's been waiting for. Is he going to have enough courage to go downstairs? He does, uh, but he lurks in the shadows. Doesn't have the courage to, to, to actually come from the shadows and meet his son uh, tries to run from it because it's too much for him only to be heard by Boston and kind of forced to come out into the light. When he's in the shadows looking out, he's, it's like two, he's in like two worlds. On one hand, he says, my beautiful rock star. On the other hand, he says, I can't. I can't face him. I can't deal with it. It's really a problem for Charlie and one, you know, I dare say he's made for himself, but nonetheless, you've got great sympathy for him. Uh, but he now is brought out uh, and he does communicate with his son and he leaves and he's excited about it, uh, but his anxiety overtakes him. And Boston is kind of interested too because Hey, Charlie liked one of his songs, and he mentioned that he might be able to help him. So Boston is a bit on the interested side, and Charlie has met his son for the first time. But as things happen, the next day, of course, Charlie's talking to Jake, uh, probably waiting again to speak to Boston, and Boston's on his way into the bar, but with Curtis. And Boston saying to Curtis, hey, I want you to meet this guy. I met him last night. I don't know even what he's like or who he is or whatever. But the bottom line is, you know, he says he's going to help me with the music and he likes a couple of my tunes. So Curtis being the ever suspicious guy says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, he does not know what's in store for him. Nor does Charlie know what's in store for him. But when Curtis comes through the door with Boston, holy cow. Eyes meet Charlie and Curtis. Jeez, talk about anxiety. Boom, like that, panic attack, panic attack. Of course, 
Curtis doesn't want Boston to know he's gay, and Charlie doesn't want Boston to know he's gay, and Charlie and Curtis don't want Boston to know that they've had sex together. This is a really tense moment. Of course, Boston is oblivious to what's going on. However, Charlie gets through it, gets out of there, but it was just, you know, too much to take without question. You know, in fact, so difficult because now he finds that or he's of the opinion that Charlie is definitely going to, or, or that I should say, uh, Curtis is definitely going to out him to Boston, and uh, it's all over. Uh, so bad that he can't even ride his bike to the hospital. His anxiety is so strong, the pain is so great uh, that he has to get a cab. Um, and this begins what we call bad guys close in for 10 pages. Uh, starts at page 55 um, and, and goes through to page 75. Um, a very important part of a screenplay because it now has to set the tone for what's going to happen later on and this is now the top of the downslope uh, for the uh, for the film um, so Charlie ends up in hospital uh, serious this time Boston finds out that Ali's got a new guy upsets him terribly um, uh, and um, Curtis uh, uh, is uh, uh, jealous of uh, of Charlie and jealous of uh, Boston's uh, even speaking to uh, to Allie, and of course, uh, then we have um, the scene between uh, Curtis, Boston, and Grace. Grace confirms to Boston that the thing that Allie's thing with this new new guy is serious, and of course, uh, Curtis uh, is trying to find a way to become intimate with Boston. Uh, and Boston just kind of rejects all this, ends up in a, in a little play yard, uh, and uh, very important because it's the kind of suggest that Boston is very infantile when, when it comes to sexuality, so we really don't know whether uh, he's a, a closeted homosexual or whether he's heterosexual with fears. Uh, either way, we're going to find out very soon, of course, because um, right after that, um, uh, we find what we call uh, all is lost. And the all is lost is the hero, Charlie, is now told by the doctors it's only a matter of weeks. There's nothing more that they can do. The pills probably won't help. Uh, so they basically say to him, you're on your own. You have to do what you have to do to stay alive or otherwise. Uh, of course, Charlie is bent on helping Boston, you know, uh, and maybe getting him a leg up in the industry or or just spending time with him, whatever it is, but he certainly doesn't want to die without achieving something of that nature with Boston, but it will always be short of um, short of telling him the truth, okay? So then what happens uh, is um, we, um, with the all is lost, uh, move into uh, the dark night of the soul. Uh, now keep in mind, Charlie is living now day by day, right? Uh, and uh, he's got to, uh, he's got to try to reach some resolve with his son without telling him the truth. The doctor says, hey, you ever been fishing? Go and enjoy the fresh air. It's the last fresh air you're going to enjoy. So Boston is invited by Charlie to go fishing and they go fishing and it's quite a lovely little scene you know Charlie's fighting the pain and fighting off death but he is going to fish and he does and he enjoys every minute of it until he has the rug pulled out from underneath him again when Boston confesses to Charlie that um, that uh, he hates his father I mean that's got to be a killer for him anyways that carries us through into what we call the break into three. That's act three, right? Uh, and in the break into three, um, this is where the first time that now Curtis uh, and Charlie's relationship is revealed to Boston, but Boston is also confronted by Curtis with the prospect of sex. Uh, and uh, there's a lovely moment in this scene where, you know, Boston has great affection for Curtis. And Curtis does Boston. Uh, but Curtis goes that one 
bridge too far, that one step across the line, so to speak. Yet Boston tries desperately to oblige him. He returns the kiss uh, only to find out that uh, it's not uh, something that he can bring to the table. Of course, Curtis answers this with jealousy and outs Charlie, which really affects Boston because now Boston feels betrayed by Charlie. He runs over to the apartment. He pounds on the door, literally pushes way in and accuses Charlie of lying and using him because he believes the only reason now that Charlie befriended him was to get him into bed or to get into his pants. And he feels betrayed by that because he believed in Charlie. He even says, you know, he was, feels so pathetic because he actually believed that Charlie could be his father. Uh, really uh, interesting in that, you know, it underlies the stupidity of Charlie in this case for not telling the truth at the start. Uh, but Charlie still can't get it out. Kurt, or I should say Boston runs from the apartment, goes uh, back to the playground, sits on the beach, uh, completely broken. Charlie can't follow, he doesn't have the health, uh, but he does, you know, turn to someone who he always turned to in his life to crisis, and that was his manager, Harriet. So, uh, Charlie places the call to Harriet. Harriet's gonna come in. She's going to evaluate the situation and take it from there right through to the end of the screenplay. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little hint. Uh, watch for the teddy bear, okay? That's enough for now. Uh, I'll be back to sum up the whole screenplay, just the last few scenes um, when uh, I posted them uh, early next week uh, on Steam It, okay? So look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye.